You've just slam dunked a series, immortalised yourself by pinning something that so many people have found resonates with them. Where do you go from there? Today we're continuing our look at the author of Shaman King, Hiroyuki Takei, taking a look at what happens next and how his style and tropes have changed. This is Broadly Takei, part 2, in the years after Shaman King. Here's today's menu. We're going to start by taking a quick journey through Takei's works after Shaman King ended, then getting into the main course, that is, Neko Gahara. We'll overview the series, then do a quick run through of the plot and story, then crack into a proper review. Finally, to look at the ways Takei's style has grown, developed, or stayed the same compared to his earlier works, and ask the question, why has Shaman King been Takei's breakout hit, and these other series have not come close? That's the menu, and let's crack in. A scene. This. <laughs> no, should I? Let's pick up after the proper ending of Shaman King. It's 2009, and the Kanzen Barns have just finished with the full ending of the series. In the same year, Takei was also working on another series by the name Karakuri Doji Ultimo, or just Ultimo. This series was conceptualized by Stan Lee, of all people. Yes, that Stan Lee and is based around virtues and vices personified into Automata. This is a series Takei would continue to work on all the way till its conclusion in 2015, becoming possibly Takei's most read work outside of the Shaman King sphere. The following year in 2010 brought a new series, Jamboa, where the powers of construction are on full display. This series is a rework of another series of the same name, Juki Ningen Jamboa, which Takei released in 2007 between the Shaman King endings. That original version was completed in just 10 chapters, whereas this version, I believe, is still coming out, albeit on hiatus at the moment. Both series following the same sort of premise, construction superpowers. By 2012, it's time for Shaman King to make a comeback in Shaman King Flowers, the first mainline sequel. While fans were excited to see the series return, it didn't make a big splash. Maybe if they dropped an English version at the time, rather than eight years later. But anyways, by 2014, the publisher Jump X went under, and Flowers went with it, during the middle of the Death Zero arc. This left the Shaman King extended story completely open-ended, with no conclusion in sight. The next year in 2015, Ultimo had just come to its conclusion, and Flowers had officially stopped. Takei picked up two new series this year, firstly a sequel to Dash Yonkuro called Hyper Dash Yonkuro, which still continues slowly to this day, though good luck to you if you're trying to find an English copy anywhere. The other series is entirely Takei's own creation, Neko Gahara, which ran into 2018, a three-year run. This becomes, at the time of recording, Takei's most recent series unrelated to Shaman King, also the series that we'll be looking at today. Also, of course, ongoing is the wider Shaman King world in Superstar, Marcos, and A Garden. If you're curious about any of those, here's one I have prepared earlier. Why Neko Gahara? Let's pull up a table of Takei's works. Thanks, Wikipedia. I mean, it's incomplete, but thanks. What we want to look at is a series that Takei has complete control over to see his style. So let's start by crossing out the Shaman King series. We've already looked at them and we'll include Butsu Zone in that as well. Let's cross out remakes and sequels. Let's cross out the one that Stan Lee pitched the concepts for. And that leaves us with two. The original Jumbo, which ended in 10 chapters and got essentially remade into a better series, or Neko Gahara, 29 chapters and 11 years more recent. Sounds like Neko is the series for us. This is the concept. It's isolationist era Japan, wandering samurai, government corruption, ninjas, and local lords, but with cats. We follow Nora Chio, we're going to shorten it to Nora for the rest of this video. He's a wandering swords cat, looking for his master. In this world, humans exist, so cats are divided between those with masters, belled cats, and the strays. Nora is infamous for having killed a human being, the Red Warrior, in defense of his master, a deposed landlord, and he has a loaded past. We follow him and a few friends he makes as he gets pulled into a grander story involving an intended international coup, religious zealotry, and subtle sects of the shogunate. Reception of the series has been pretty positive, mostly undercut by a very speedy conclusion, the story setting up a narrative that would have been better served stretched across more chapters. Unlike other stories like Butsu or Flowers, it doesn't seem like there was a publishing reason for the rushed conclusion, or at least none that I could find. What this suggests is that it was Takei's call to wrap it up as he did. I have my own suspicions as to why, but let's run through the story first. Meet Nora Chio, Cat Samurai. He's on a quest to find his master whom he lost many years ago. 
One day he heads into town only to be attacked by a local gang led by Amemura Short. Nora ends up killing the whole gang besides Short himself before moving on. Another cat, Shishiwaka, appears, a bounty hunter looking to collect on Nora. Short and Shishi team up to take him down, but Nora gets away. The injured Nora gets restored by a traveling priest and sets off to get his revenge on Shishi. He goes with the most painful method possible, which involves... and... Now we meet our antagonist, Shiriya Abihai. I have no idea how to pronounce his name, but he's a member of the secret police. After the altercation with Shishi, he's leading the hunt for Nora. He rallies the local cat guard and they begin the search. Returning to our friendly priest, we learn that he might not be so innocent either. Ebihai and the priest get into a fight when all of a sudden the holy man substitution jutsus out of there. As Nora is escaping the area, he gets ambushed by Mukuro, a representative of the Clouder of Extraordinary Cats, a group of shinobi that the priest is also a part of. She offers a space for Nora to join them, which he promptly turns down. After a quick fight, she logs out also. Not wanting to miss out on the action, Short has also joined the hunt for Nora. We learn a bit more about Short here. He's the son of a higher up landlord. I'm not sure of the correct term, but he lives in a castle and controls a good chunk of land. Anyways, this is Amemura Rikan, and it looks like he's hired some pretty nasty criminals to keep his land in order. These cats come from The Pound, a brutal place of exile where only the toughest survive. Also important to note that Rikan is the one who usurped Nora's master. Back with Short, he finds Nora and the two get into a fight. They end up knocking each other out and are picked up by the shinobis from before. The priest runs into Shishi and convinces him to ally with the two unconscious cats. Shishi knows that Rakan wants his son dead because, well, he's a horrible cat being, so Shishi tentatively creates the party, the group's interests loosely aligning. Rakan wants Short dead, Nora already hates Rakan for deposing his master, Shishi's mortal enemy is working for Rakan. His story is a bit more complex, so we're leaving it out for the moment. For now, a loose camaraderie has been made between the three cats. The next day, one of the pound cats sent from Rakan picks a fight with the new team. Through the power of jolly cooperation, they manage to defeat him, which cements their new friendship. The plan now? Jump into the fire, go to the castle in Heisen, and attack Rakan directly. Then, Abihai finds them. Not just Nora, but all three now wanted. They get into a fight with him, and it turns out he's strong. Suspiciously main character strong. It turns out that Abihai was the one who took Nora's eye. The gang barely managed to get away from him to safety before asking for the full story behind Nora's missing eye. So Nora goes on to share his backstory with the gang, how he killed a human and fled a burning castle to go and find his missing master. He got recruited by a younger Abihai, who was a thug at the time, not a policeman, second in command of a local gang. That wasn't enough for Abihai though, who went on to kill the number one and take over the gang, taking Nora's eye in the process. Backstory over, the gang get picked up by the priest and Mukuro. They've arranged a boat for them to sail to Heisen for the final showdown. After they arrive, the gang runs some errands, while the shinobi find the truth of what's going on. After figuring it all out, the priest ends up being killed by one of the pound cats. Mukuro flees to let us know what's happening. Abihai is the real menace here. He knows all of Rakan's crimes and has secretly been leading the pound cats that Rakan thought he was controlling. Abihai is going to use his role as secret police to depose Rakan and strike a blow of faith at the shogunate. He's been colluding with foreign allies to raise an insurrection. Right now, taking over Heisen is the first crucial step in starting a civil war. So the battle for Heisen Castle begins. The gang take out some of the pound cats as Abihai goes against Rakan. The battle rages on as Rakan falls. Now Abihai needs to take out Nora's gang. He dons the red warrior armor and lures Nora away. This begins the final clash between the two. They have the final showdown and Nora ends up the victor. Time skip to epilogue the series. Nora is still on his journey, now to find his master's grave, learning that he had perished years earlier. Some thugs approach looking to cut down an old Nora. These are the kids of the cats Nora killed in the first chapter, here for revenge. They end up leaving him with a mortal wound, but not finished. Nora struggles on, bleeding heavily, until he finds what he's looking for. And there he dies, at the foot of his master's grave. Probably the first thing you'll notice about Neko Gahara is, holy moly, Takei's art? He has come a long way from the early days of Butsu Zone. Out of all of Takei's works, I think this is the best it gets, or at least it's personally my favourite so far. This really struck me after looking at Butsu Zone with the boat scenes. Both series get these panels, which I can't tell if it's an homage back to Butsu or just a scene Takei likes to draw, but look at the difference, it's night and day. 
In that 2004 to 2007 break between Shaman King endings, Takei changed his standard art inputs, moving from analog to digital. I think he took to it like a duck to water. We can see that early in the Kanzenban Shaman King chapters, but 10 years later in Nekogahara, it's at its best. Even the panelling itself, where text is placed and when scenes can just have the image do the talking, are great. I don't want to gush on the art for too long, because I mean, you can see it. Let's talk about the story. And we'll start with that ending. The series always feels a little like this. Things are paced fast, but well enough, right up until the final couple of chapters when Takei hits P-Speed and starts booking it. I think you really feel it when Mukuro just turns to essentially the reader and lays out Abby High's plan. From then on, it's go, 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 clean up the pound cats, get Rikan out of here, get short his fight, get Shishi his fight, get Nora to the final shot, and go, go, go! It's just really fast. There are some great moments in this ending though. The epilogue particularly works surprisingly well. Nora's final journey to his master's grave is sad, and after the big bombastic fights of the ending, it's not an easy thing to land. I credit the ending poem hugely to its success. Firstly, just because, well, I'm a sucker for this kind of stuff, but secondly, because it slows you as the reader down to read it, meaning that this two-page spread changes gears so well into a slower conclusion. Also, while I think Nora's final showdown with Abby High is a bit, eh, there's no big reveals or payoffs or anything, Shishi's is really good, which means it's time to talk about the B plot of the series. In the story section we covered the main plot, but concurrently running is Shishi's history, his connection to Abby High's second in command, and this religious aspect in Nekogahara. There's surprisingly a lot in here, in this B plot, so here are the cliff notes of that journey summarised as best I can. Shishi was a foreign missionary's son. His father was essentially head priest, with this other local cat, Shiro, becoming second in command. Shiro's faith was so great and pure that she became a beacon for religious cats. Despite Shishi and Shiro following a genuine faith, the head priest had actually come over from another country with malicious intent. He was really here to start trafficking people out of the country, using religion as an excuse to get in and as a way to manipulate the people around him. Eventually this reached the shogunate, so they raised an army against the religious community that had formed. The head priest claimed religious persecution and rallied his congregation into uprising against the army. In the battle that followed, the church was destroyed and Shiro burned at the stake. Miraculously, Shiro survived the whole ordeal, which gave her the idea she was not just blessed by God, she had become as God. She ends up following a similar path to the priest, manipulating a gang of young girls to fight alongside her in pursuit of a better world. Basically, Shiro wants to manipulate the world just like she was manipulated, but into being happy and leading better lives. How this ties back into the A plot is that Shiro became Abby High's second in command, believing she could use him to expand her influence. Also in that Nora's master was sent as part of the army as he was both a representative of the shogunate and part of that religion. He ended up using most of his time evacuating believers from the war zone, and was beheaded by the state to set an example. Okay, that's it. Surprisingly strong B-plot. Back to the character endings. So yeah, I don't think that Nora's is that great, but Shishi's is. This is his final battle with Shiro. We've seen Shiro fight and kill the shinobi priest, and even has the cats from the pound in fear of her. So she's built up as an imposing threat. She's been using this ability to draw her sword and make people's heads come off. During this fight, it pays off just about everything set up for both characters, as well as concluding the B-plot. It ties back into Shishi's early established motivations, it explains Shiro's head popping technique, it uses different elements laid out early in the story to drive the action, and it works! The whole fight, as short as it is, just works. This is one of the best ways to set up a conclusion. Get emotions high based on the conflicting traits of the characters. Use all of the things you know about the character, tie together elements of the series that the reader has learned about. Finally, give the win to the person who has grown more on their journey, using something from their journey as their means of winning. In saying that, Nora does that too. How Shishi gets the win is a little bit surprising in a good way. Nora just uses the signature move of a swordsmith he met a few chapters prior. One pays off investment into the whole series, the other just the last volume. Let's change tack and talk about the world. It doesn't work. I mean it's gorgeous, but it doesn't work. Let's start positive though, there's a lot of good here. Bringing in both elements of an Edo era samurai story and things about cats, the isolationism and religion of Krasushian, Nekogahara's version of Christianity, the architecture and infrastructure, they use catnip as a drug problem wrecking different towns, Nora asks for a drink and he gets it in a saucer, they go to the bathroom and it's a litter tray, even the vernacular, how they speak, is dripping with cat puns and substitution with cat terms. Instead of a young girl, it's a molly. Instead of foreign barbarians, they're purbarians. Okay, maybe they're not all great. 
But why doesn't it work? The story starts with the idea that Nora had a human master and killed a human being in defense of him. We never see a human being in this series besides Nora's fever dreams of the Red Warrior. So there are humans here, this isn't a story where it's just the humans are substituted with equivalent cats. Which means the world is painted as like a cat version with events happening at the same time as human events that we just don't get to see. Like why would Nora's human master need to go to shut down a cat religious group? Are human events happening concurrently with the cat events and we just don't see the humans? Are the cats doing their own thing, in which case Abby High's plan is a mass cat revolution which changes what in the real world? It just gets a real bit sticky trying to figure out how this all works. Overall, I find myself comparing this to another series that actually apparently happens to be one of Takei's favourites, Blade of the Immortal by Hiroaki Samura, another wandering samurai series where the main character is kind of an ass. That's a series I recommend more on its art style than anything else, and it's quite similar here for Nekogahara. Though to be fair, the story here is surprisingly strong for only 29 chapters. The art is brilliant and it's enjoyable to read, but to contrast, Immortal ran too long, which worked against it. Nekogahara runs too short, really needing more chapters to make that ending hit. But let's move on. For a quick should you read? Yeah, absolutely. You don't need to be an SK or a Takei fan to enjoy this series. Yes, there are some flaws with it, and the very rushed ending can retroactively bring the whole series down, but it's good. It has a plot that actually has some layers to it, characters the same, the art's brilliant. At only 29 chapters, it's not a huge commitment. If you get the chance, I definitely recommend checking it out. Nekogahara is an interesting series to try and find parallels in, mainly from the distinct visual style to the rest of his catalogue. At least, that's what I thought at first. While certainly improved, this is still definitely Takei, and he gave me exactly what I wanted. Some scenes in Neko to directly contrast. Here's the boat scene from Neko and Butsu Zone. Them pulling in, or the boat sailing away at nighttime. These series are 20 years apart, and I think Takei has developed hugely as an artist. You could put a chunk of this down to him moving to digital art, though harder to show is how the improvement in layout and panelling is done, a result of experience more than anything else. In story, the series falls into the same trap as Butsu Zone did, likewise for the original Jamboa. It sets up a world much bigger than it has time to play with. Just like with Butsu, this is easiest seen with the named gang of heroes and villains that only briefly show up and go out unceremoniously. The cats from the pound, every one of them is named. Only two of the seven get to have an impact on the story, one of those being Shiro herself. Likewise for the clouder of extraordinary cats, although beyond the two important ones, they're not named. The point being, when you take the time and focus to set up these groups, especially for those that become named characters, we expect more out of them. Seeing them easily cut down in a few panels trivializes them in the series and gives the impression that the author has stopped caring about the series. Hold that thought. Much like his other shorter series, this is another example of a rushed decay ending. Though as mentioned earlier, this doesn't seem to be the result of a cancellation. My personal opinion is that he lost the passion for the series, so self-imposed wrapping it up quickly. Now don't read this as me hating on Takei, not at all. All things considered, I would suspect this is the right call. I have a lot of respect for Takei, and I doubt that he would intentionally try to bring down his own series. So why do I think he was losing passion for Nekogahara? Takei likes drawing cool things, giant spirit guardians, detailed racing cars, colossal construction machines. The cool thing in Nekogahara are the samurai cat designs, oh, and debatably the Edo architecture, but finding ways to anthropomorphize cats into their own world. In early chapters, this leads to unique designs in the characters. Here's a selection of characters from the first chapter. As the series continues, characters stray further and further from the cat design towards human. Some characters just look like human beings with big ears. Okay, so I was halfway through writing this when I had an epiphany. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to present to you The Takei Guy, a mysterious apparition that seems to stalk through the works of Takei. Here he is in Nekogahara, years earlier in Ultimo, even earlier again in the first Jumbo. Probably hiding in other series too, probably not a conspiracy, probably just a design Takei can do without thinking, like writing your signature. I imagine if I put him on the spot now to draw a regular guy, Takei would just draw me Takei Guy. Circling back, yes, I think Takei was losing passion in creating this series. Sadly, I can't find sales figure for the manga volumes to know what their initial sales were like. In his interview with Archipel, he mentions that with Shaman King, he was really glad when the cancellation came down, and he wished it had come sooner. He describes it as incredibly difficult to end a series, struggling to know what to draw. 
For him, seeing his mangas struggling in popularity is the hardest thing, a very personal thing. Better to end it sharply than letting it bleed to death hanging over him. So as much as I can rag on his endings for being rushed, I can see the reasons why it's probably for the best, both for the series and for the man's mental health. Before we jump into the final section, let's real quickly talk about the characters and tone. This is another lighthearted series where the tone is more enjoyable than the uh, gags. Takei has a great way of establishing such a peaceful presence in his main cast. He says he often finds inspiration for his main characters coming from himself, which might be what leads to this tone. Takei seems like such a chill dude. What's cool in Nikogahara is that the hero isn't really a great guy. He does some nice things, but equally he's killing people in the street. It's a nice change of pace from the Yos and Senjus. Somehow this peaceful dynamic between the main gang is still achieved. I'm not sure how he does it, but it's like Takei's secret sauce that just comes through either intentionally or not. Style aside, let's take a look at that big question. Let's bring it back to one of the original questions. Why has Shaman King been Takei's breakout hit and these other series haven't come close? Not that they just didn't get as big, but most had comparably short runs without making much of a splash. This isn't why Shaman King became a big deal, we could talk about the great characters, the benefits of having localised animes, interesting concepts and better pacing, teehee, we found a way to bring up the remake. This is more, have these other series simply not done enough to warrant wider appeal? After taking a dive through these series, my answer is no. But also, yes. <laughs> That's an awful answer, I'm sorry, let me explain. I think Decay's style runs through all his works quite strongly. The easygoing feel of the main parties, the strong dynamic built quickly between the heroes, the named gang of villains each using a unique quirk, a more character focused journey more important than the actual plot. I think these are brilliant aspects in Takei's work, ones which thrive in series where they have the space to grow naturally. This was something Butsu Zone was growing to and didn't get the chance to. Shaman King getting that chance to continue through the character development and widening cast. Nikogahara running a much more condensed and quicker version. I wonder if Shaman King would have anywhere near its success if it was confined to just a 29 chapter series. As manga fans, we have a tendency to praise long running series much more than shorter ones. For most people, our favourite series are all 100 chapters plus, and that's the same for me too. Perhaps that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's easier for something to have an impact when you're more invested, spent more time with the characters. So it's harder for a shorter story like Neko to leave the impact of 300 Shaman King chapters. As a prediction for the future, I don't think Takei will get another series like Shaman King. Not that he doesn't have the skills to, far from it. If anything, he's probably in a better spot now than ever before to pen another epic. I simply don't think he wants to, nor as a fan would I ever push him to. I'm still excited to see where he's going to take the Shaman King world, but I'm maybe even more excited to see if he'll pick up any new solo projects. And if he does, I'm going to be right there to support it. That's my conclusion on Takei currently. Purely my own opinions, so please don't take any of this as scripture. Let me know what your own thoughts are in the comments because I'm really curious to see how other people view Takei's work. Maybe you think I've brought up some valid points, or maybe I'm completely off the mark. At the end of the day, he's a mangaka that I love and not just for Shaman King. I'm super excited to see what he'll be working on next. As for Nekogahara, it's good! Go give it a read and enjoy it. There's so much more in that series that I couldn't talk about, so don't think you've got the whole story already. I think it's wholly underappreciated and definitely worth your time. Anyways, thanks for watching. This is my last video on Takei and Shaman King, so I hope you've enjoyed my various thoughts on the topic. Here's a playlist full of everything else SK related if you would like some more, and if you're keen to stick around, I'd be happy to have you here as we dive into a brand new series next time. This has been CG, and I'll see you G's in the next one.